All right, we are going to start the first first Fridays of the season. Thank you for your patience. Well, our three brave staff found out about all the ins and outs of our brand new presentation system. So thank you for waiting while they work that out. So greetings, my name is Linnea Anderson. On behalf of the First Fridays Committee and the Archives and Special Collections Department, welcome to First Fridays. This season's theme is To Whom It May Concern. We will explore the correspondence, letters, notes, messages, and other forms of mail that comprise the backbone of the archives. Today's presentation will also be posted later on the University of Minnesota Library's YouTube channel. First Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director, Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the university libraries, archives, and special collections. A special thank you to Alan and Tammy from Middle English Interpreting, who will be providing ASL interpretation for today's presentations. If time allows, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, Zoom audience members, if you have any questions for our speaker today, you should submit them using the Q&A function. Please use Q&A and not chat so that we can keep track of your questions. And in-person audience, please hold your questions until the end. Uh, a quick repeat of the information about items from your box lunches. If there's anything that you do not want to eat and you have not opened it, we have a bowl in the back by the door where you can place that unopened item. Uh, after the presentations, there will be a tour of our storage facilities with Chris Kiesling. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and at this point, we will pause for a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support resources and programs that increase aspects as access to all aspects of higher education for Native American students, staff, faculty, and community members. So our presentations today feature the Performing Arts Archives and a talk by staff from our Central Processing Unit that features materials from across the department. So our first presentation is Drama in the Archives, Correspondence from Behind the Scenes, presented by Deborah Alton, curator of the Performing Arts Archives. Legacy dance, theater, and music companies from the state of Minnesota found their way through passionate personalities mixed with big dreams and a lot of drama. The talk presents letters of directors, visionaries, administrators, critics, students, and teachers from the Performing Arts Archives. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Well, great. Thank you. It's so exciting to see you all here. It's um, this this remind me. So I came to the university in two thousand, um, and that let's see, it was like a few months before that I came in for my interview, and Wilson Library in our seminar room. It was packed. There was standing room only, and I remember our collections person at the time, Jim Cogswell. He came up to me and he apologized and said, we weren't expecting this many people. Um, but what's so um, rewarding is that we're all interested in these collections and what we're doing as librarians. So thank you all for coming. So I am your new curator in the Performing Arts Archives. Um, uh, like I said, I've been at the university for many years. My original background in art history, I'm still handling the art history and fine arts collections. As well with a background in theater and dance, I've been handling our general research collections in theater and dance. 
Um, our performing arts archive position has been vacant since before COVID. We had a superb curator prior to that, Cecily Marcus, who is now at the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, it occurred to me, because I was spending so much time in this building with the rare art uh, collection that we have here, that it might be a good idea for me to just focus and stay here and focus on all the collections that um, are really close to my heart. So I was very fortunate to um, move into this position. Kind of hit the ground running when I came into the position this summer. And um, there was a vacancy in our exhibition schedule. And because I've done so many exhibits, I thought, yeah, no problem, I can do this. So um, I've been learning this new job and creating an exhibit. And then I had this idea for First Friday. So I threw in my proposal last minute. Oh, I'm so excited, drama and archives, because I know there's a lot of drama and archives. I was hoping to get scheduled in December. But no, because I was the last one to get my proposal in, I'm the first one. <laughs> so my point being that there is drama in archives, but there's also a lot of drama right here, right now. So welcome to that. Um, so I really look at this as um, how our art archives in a way can come to life by looking at who people are, their characters and personalities. So I bring up some things in this collection today that um, may, may be in some ways difficult and challenging to look at because we all have moments in our life that are not our best moments, and they make it into the archives. <laughs> so um, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm just referencing our history and our personalities and our history. Um, I also want to recognize two very, very important people that have been supporting me as I come into this position. I was very fortunate to um, have an intern last spring um, who graduated with a focus in library studies. And I was able to hire Molly Ray Miller, and if you'd please stand up, as um, uh, a temporary and fabulous So she's with me 14 hours a week and doing superb work and has re and really helped with this presentation as we dove into all these different collections. Some that I was familiar with, some not as much. So I really needed the help to make sure that as the first speaker <laughs> i was ready to do this and then we just recently hired a student employee and we trained them in um and kaylin and i are both in training together molly ray too um with learning central processing and working in our archive space to make sure the catalog records are, are all correct and our finding aid our finding aids so i want to introduce kaylin howard because she dove in right away and helped sort through some of these archives to pull out some um our, our dramatic correspondence okay so here we go let me coordinate myself here okay all right so thank you, Linnea, for introducing me and um, our theme. And if you are not familiar at all with the Performing Arts Archives, I just want to note that it was established in 1971. There have been three curators. Al Lathrop was our first curator, Cecily Mark, our, our second curator, and I'm the third curator, and it's an honor. I want to start with a kind of a smaller collection that we just um, acquired, the Bel Canto Voices. In our, in our, um, when you look records up, you'll see that there are. Um, she's covering the screen. <laughs> Sorry, so I'll get it. <laughs> Um, you'll see that there are collection notes, so you can read you can read it for yourself. You can see um, what kinds of materials each collection has. So not all of them are, of course, the same. Um, so in this case, what we have are some letters to Janice Kimes um, about the significance of the work that that she did. And okay, sorry, I want to.
You were arranged to dash all over town, dragging 17 girls behind you while I prepare to get on the phone and confuse all of your arrangements. Apologies for that and no excuses, but the end result was glorious. Our women were so appreciative and so responsive to the beautiful voices and your wonderful selections. Oh, if all concerts could be so predictably perfect. It was lovely to hear your gorgeous voice again, too. Audrey was flabbergasted. I talked to John Cranny about you and some weeks before, and he said that you should call him, that maybe there is something workable for the both of you. Let's talk. Thank you. Thank you again. And to all your lovely singers, what a bunch. You know, when you read a letter like that, it makes you think, I should write somebody a letter like that. <laughs> because wow. Okay, let's see. Okay, it's not forwarding. I don't know why it's not forwarding. There's <laughs> drama. <laughs> it's a new room. Let's see. Oh, should I just click it? Yeah. Okay, I'll just click it. That's okay. Sorry. So um, if you step into the exhibit, you'll see that we have um, reference to the Minnesota Dance Alliance, which is an extremely important organization to the dance community, bringing um, a, a lot of the community together. And some of their publications you'll see um, or with interviews with some of the dance community. I just want to point out, um, Patrick Scully has been a very important part of our dance community, kind of breaking uh, boundaries in many ways. And what I love about this, um, this particular journal was they're talking about memory. And one of the things that I try to bring out in that exhibit, that hopefully you'll, you'll take a look, is that our archives are here to help us remember with integrity. And so I picked up this particular journal and it's about illuminating memory. And I just wanna point out, it notes um, that memory is a fluid state of image. Memory is light. Memory, the wind. Memory, illumination. And I just, that resonated with me so much. I, I loved it. Okay. Oh, oh, now I went too far. <laughs> I don't know how to get back. Okay, let's see. Oh, Monica, can I go back? Do you know how to go back? It's, those aren't working. <laughs> What slide are you on? He's only going forward. There we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you. Okay, so how do I get it to a forward? <laughs> there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so hopefully um, some of you know about Stanislas Korovachevsky, who is one of our um, Minnesota Orchestra conductors. Um, we have his collection along with the Minnesota Orchestra collection, which is one of our biggest collections. And um, we have all sorts of amazing correspondence within this collection. Um, in this particular slide what I was showing this correspondence between um, a, a publisher and the Australian the Australian Broadcasting Commission so when Stanislav was traveling he was hoping that a recording would be advertised and he the letters crossed and things didn't work out right and so they said nope sorry kind of a disappointing moment. <laughs> The Guthrie Theater is also another one of our very vast collections. And so we did pull a bunch of stuff from here. Um, you can see just from the little clips that we show you, woman dies, even though we clearly disagree. Um, one, one of the kind of funny um, correspondences that was back and forth was about their production called um, Six Degrees of Separation, um, where apparently there was um, some 
objectionable nudity. <laughs> and there were a ton of letters that called this out. What I love and what I just want to show you here, we don't have to get into the specifics of it, and maybe you can read a, a little bit on your own, is the difference between the handwritten letter um, and the typed letter, and not that I'm judging them, but there is something about that handwritten letter that maybe we still love, and it just offers that extra personal feeling to it. Um, that isn't to say that we are not accepting digital materials because we are, <laughs> and we are working with them um, uh, very carefully and learning all about it. We have a great team who's, who's working on our digital preservation. Um, so more about exposing scenes, um, our six degrees of separation, and then a fashion faux pas. So I'm going to read this letter because I love this. Kaylin, did you pick this one? <laughs> I, okay, so we, we had so much fun doing this. You, you, we probably just like woke up the entire library um, laughing at everything. But um, this woman is uh, horrified by the shoes that the um, actress wore on the stage and she was like she wore a brown tartan skirt correct to the period but not the shoes i expect she managed to sneak on stage without the costume director's knowledge <laughs> everyone else in my humble opinion was correct i was taught drama in england at a vocational school and my teachers always emphasized that the details matter so down to the shoes <laughs> Um, and the written letter to whom it may concern was also about um, uh, Romeo and Juliet. So apparently there were a few shows that the Guthrie did, Joe Dowling um, at the time, um, directed. And um, yeah, there was a call out to perversity. So there was controversy. He was challenging audiences. Okay. This one's really sad, but it's also, I, I mean, oddly fun. So there was a car they, that they lent to one of the staff, and the staff um, ended up, did she kill her mother? I, I, it was, was, it, yes, it was the mother of the roommate. The mother of the roommate. So one of the staff was given permission to take a Guthrie rental car and help with moving and drove up to the apartment and managed to kill the roommate's mother. So that's on the Guthrie. So that was a little bit of a problem, kind of a tragedy. Um, so they didn't rent, let staff take the rental cars after that. <laughs> So this one's really funny, too. There was a lot of um, office drama. So I love the handwritten note. So the rules of the drama shop, as they have been made apparent to me, include such restrictions as no liquor sold unopened, no liquor sold to go out of dr the drama shop. These are necessary restrictions if we are to keep the drama, in, uh, drama shop in operation. I do my best to enforce these restrictions without prejudice, as does Kevin Quayle. Um, on, on numerous occasions, members of the artistic administration um, and the, the assistants, as well as so-and-so, have asked me to make exceptions on their behalf. <laughs> it is my belief that an even-handed treatment of all the faculty and staff at the theater is absolutely necessary, not only in the interests of fairness, but to keep the bar open. I have spoken to Mr. Wright about this. Actually, I've spoken to everyone. <laughs> it is because they persist in their desires for special treatment that I now turn to you. If I am to bend the rules, I will bend them for all. So everybody got to go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> the smoking? The oh, the smaller note. Okay, Ed, he's right. 
So get us a refrigerator. <laughs> now we really know what's going on behind the scenes at the Guthrie. Anyone want a job? <laughs> um, okay, so um, some administrative drama. There was some, uh, I don't know, some stealing going on. So we got some, uh, we, you know, kind of looked into some of the notes on that, just so you can see that when we collect the administrative records, it's not so straightforward all the time. This one is about the building. When um, so this is from Mike Ehrlichman. So some of some of you may know. So they were having trouble fitting in the number of um, seats in the auditorium and making room um, for uh, accessibility seating. Um, so this is just a letter. I'm chagrined that I required a reminder from Larry Redmond that I owed you a long overdue call. I mean, I love the drama, right? Um, despite my delays in communicating, we have been making progress. And he goes on to talk about the idiosyncratic nature of the Guthrie's architecture. It's double-edged. For example, the fact that there are no right angles in a strong as a strong identifying characteristic, and so on. So, of course, then there is drama that um, is scandalous, outrageous, romantic, and introspective. And the archives are full of it, from the delicate moments to the rewarding to the bristly. So I think we've shown a little bit of all of that so far, and we'll continue. So this is the scandal that's a really tough one to bring up. It's from the Children's Theater. If some of you are new to town and are not familiar, but our very former talented uh, director was arrested in 1984 um, in criminal child sexual abuse. So it was a very difficult moment for many people. So here is the letter about that and how the board chose to deal with it. They built some task forces and they started working with other um, uh, creative centers to work through all the difficulties. Um, I think, yeah, is that all we included on that? Because there, there were some newsletters and there were some written letters that um, showed so much compassion for Donahue. I don't think everybody totally understood yet what was going on and lots of correspondence going on. Um, some saying, you should be doing more and some saying, you know, maybe we don't know it. Thing. So there is um, quite a bit of correspondence on that. Our other very challenging moment in our artistic community was with the Minnesota Dance um, Theater, the MDT, um, under uh, the direction of Lois Halton, who started the company. Um, so she had a very strong personality, and she also was very passionate about her work and spent the budget, like to the point where the board didn't know what to do. And so they decided to release her from her position. This caused a huge controversy because Lois was very well loved. I don't know if any of you have seen like the Nutcracker, they're still performing her choreography from the Nutcracker. It's one of my favorite. Um, in 2000, like about three, four years after I got here, I did an exhibit, um, The Legacy of Lois. Um, that exhibit is online and I pulled from all the archives. So I knew this letter was here. Um, there's a, a bunch of letters. Um, so this one is like recently after reading newspaper articles and talking to people who have close ties with MDT school and board, I have become aware of the board's decision to strip Lloyd's Halton of her title and power. I have been a longtime supporter of MDT and its school, taking two to three classes a year for at least four years, recruiting other adult students, buying something at the bake or wear sale, attending all fundraisers, Black Jack Ball, Crystal Ball, Sorcerer's Ball, and almost all company productions. I recently returned from my 
uh, from Europe and was planning on registering for my usual two classes and attending the ball, but I find I cannot support a company or school that treats the woman they recognize as its founder, who for 24 years has bore, poured blood, sweat, and tears into this organization and is responsible for what had, it has become today in such an outrageous and trashy manner. So clearly he felt very betrayed by her ousting. Then there's all sorts of unforeseen correspondence. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, are we at time? Are we running, Lena, I have a little, five minutes? Okay. Um, so if any of you are familiar, remember Gaten's and the holiday show, um, Jack Edwards did scenic design and created all these beautiful puppets and all sorts of just fantastical stuff. He was a huge um, force in the community, big personality and a big fellow. Um, there's so much correspondence to him and it's all so lively. Um, there, this one I really appreciate. Okay, so first of all, this one is just unexpected and funny. Um, the parrots are fine. Pepita has grown and is nearly as large as Pedro, who has changed very little. They knew us and they knew us and wasted no time getting in line for attention, and so on. So we get some very personal notes, like I'm sure Jack Edwards knows what that's all about. Um, but this one is really quite um, charming. Dear Jack, you are definitely one of the many reasons I am so proud and happy to be out to the world. In case I haven't told you, I value your advice, your company, your friendship, and you. And then it goes on. Thank you for the graduation gift and so on. <clears throat> there are a lot of very affectionate letters. Um, this one, actually, the, the drawing is a letter from Jack to Lois Hulton, um, giving her a hat, just a wee yet large gift designed to keep them guessing for another three decades at least. So then there are just disturbances in the force, like in any dramatic moment in life. Um, so in this case, I think this was... Um, Jack, Edward's son got into trouble. And so here's a letter um, from the attorney at law. So we get some of this personal stuff and it wants to stay there. We do offer our donors the opportunity if they want to take some of this back, but some of them want to hear. So here it is. And then there are letters of applause, and those are always the most rewarding. Dear Miss Hulton, my love and sympathy is with you and will always be. I miss and love you very much. I wish you were coaching Nutcracker rehearsal because you take the magic we make and turn it into something everyone loves, and so on. So there are her students write her. And then um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, Milkweed Press and... Um, uh, Emily, uh, what's her last name? What? Sit. Buckwall. Emily Buckwall. Thank you. Yes. Emily Buckwall. Dear Lois, I forget from year to year how magnificent Nutcracker is. When I watch the curtain go up and the lights go on in town and the toy makers shop, I get teary and enchanted each time. The production is filled with magic, with charm, with humor and tenderness. I was thrilled this year as I've been in the past. Thanks for giving this present to the world. Okay, so there's more about her magic everywhere. So if you haven't seen the Nutcracker, so this is the beauty of MBT. Um, her daughter, Lisa Halton, ended up taking uh, directorship of the company, and Lisa just stepped down, I don't know if you saw the Star Trip article just recently, and now Lisa's daughter, so her grandchild, is now um, directing the company. And Caitlin and I have been in touch, and the Nutcracker is going to go, everything's going as planned. And then there are honors, and I want to come back to Stanislav Strobachevsky. And this one is very dear to my heart because my dad knew Stanislav Strobachevsky. Um, 
when my dad was uh, uh, the chair of the music department and knew Stanislaw, and they honored Stanislaw Strobachevsky with an honorary uh, degree. So, dear Mr. Strobachevsky, it is my pleasure to inform you officially that the University Committee on all university honors and the Board of Regents have unanimously, unanimously voted to award you an honorary doctor, doctor of musical arts. And there is my dad's name at the bottom. He passed in 1998, way too young at 69. Um, and I just, he did so many great things too. And it's really fun to come across him in the archives as well. I want to point out Beth Obermeyer. Um, congratulations on your listing to the 1981 Guinness Book of World Records and for making Minneapolis the top capital of the world. And this you'll see more in the dance exhibit. Um, if you go to Orchestra Hall, there's an exhibit of materials from our Minnesota Orchestra archives. So there are two display cases. Kaylin and Molly Ray worked really hard on helping that to come together. I went to the orchestra the other night. They look amazing. And then our exhibit across the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Our next presentation is by Rachel Wire, project archivist, and Gemma Close, offsite collections <laughs> processing archivist, uh, both of whom work in the central processing unit here in archives and special collections. So when we come to them, with a hundred boxes and it's a hot mess, they make it make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and we appreciate that very much. So the archives and special collections central processing staff get to work with all of us. And this presentation will explore collective memory, pivotal moments in archivists' memories around correspondence and the important social transmission of these memories. Hi, <laughs> we are just going to get started. Hello and welcome again to First Fridays. We are so happy to be able to present today. My name is Rachel Weyer and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Gemma Close and I also use she, her pronouns. And today we are going to be talking about correspondence, living memory, and collective social memory. Correspondence connects us as humans and it has a wide range. It can be personal, professional, or official. Correspondence can be, but is not limited to, a hastily, if unenthusiastically written postcard, like this one reading from University Archives about a visit to the U of M, quote, I am not so fond of the state U as I am of the legible school name. Hamlin, I thought it was, but I didn't want to make, I didn't want to assume as an archivist, but here's the picture. I reached here safely and have given my music lessons and am ready to go to supper. I will write a letter soon, GCC, end quote, to a sweet telegraph. Like this one from the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives reading, quote, happy anniversary. I wish we were together on this special occasion. All my best wishes for a speedy reunion. Letters and parcels received. Many thanks, Mrs. Allen Rich, end quote. Correspondence encompasses love letters, breakup letters, letters of resignation, job offers, the full spectrum of human and institutional communication. So why then did this make us think specifically about creating a presentation on correspondence and collective memory? Correspondence is something that we take for granted, particularly when one isn't involved in the archival field. Though often it can be a way to access history and fill in gaps across history that we do not understand, which can give us information to our human collective history. Correspondence is also extremely common across various types of archives, as any human organization or relationship needs correspondence to function. This creates an interesting issue in archives, as a folder, like the one you see on the slide, Labeled correspondence could contain literally anything from a birthday card to divorce papers to administrative documents. 
Gemma and I are in a unique position here at University of Minnesota Archives and Special Collections. As some of you may know, and as it has been mentioned, the university has 14 different archival units. Each are unique and equipped with talented curators, assistant curators, techies, and students. However, Gemma, Lisa, Jeanette, who's over there, and I, I work in central processing, which works with all 14 different units and offsite collections. We see collections as they are first brought in and get to work with collections with high processing needs. This unique position allows us a glimpse of archiving, allows us a glimpse into archiving at the University of Minnesota as a whole, the importance of correspondence, the unequivocal power of collective memory, and the social transmission of memory. We are here today to talk about how collective memory is expressed, the collective memory of university archives, the impact of correspondence that correspondence has had on archivists personally and professionally, and the social transmission of memory. The idea of collective memory, put really simply, is the idea that everyone remembers a moment and can benchmark their life against that moment. For example, where were you when you first heard about the COVID lockdown? Who were you messaging about this? How did you mark time? Correspondence today looks so different than it did 20 years ago. Now it can be instantaneous. And this example points out what this correspondence can look like and the importance of context in correspondence. During the first COVID lockdown, I, like many others, was messaging my friends and family, as you can see in that first screenshot. I was, we were talking about how to get masks, how to, how to make masks and how to get groceries, how to basically survive during that first lockdown. However, on the same day, I was also messaging my friends about the show Tiger King, which I'm sure some of you may remember. Just because we have a piece of correspondence that captures one moment, one experience, that does not mean that it encompasses the totality of what was actually happening to the people involved. As archivists, it is our job to question, or as archivists, it is our job to attempt to preserve and capture history contextually. It is also our job to question how we can ethically facilitate this. Correspondence can be a key part to in providing firsthand accounts to historical events that add insight into communities' collective memory. Collective memory then is the sum of a community's recollection of these moments, how that memory operates as an independent agent, sustained by a group of people, and is often separate from any official documentation or recorded history. To begin our discussion about collective memory, we first need to look at institutional collective memory. With institutional archives, we first must acknowledge that archives are inherently colonial, and our understanding of what an archive is is entrenched in white supremacy and colonialism. Archives are artifacts of that heritage. This understanding of the collective memory of the University of Minnesota archives is important to understand contextually. Most universities collect and acquire items in similar ways, and correspondence is an excellent way to look at that history. So let's look at where the University of Minnesota archives officially began. This is a correspondence to Lotus Kaufman from William Fowle dated December 31st, 1927. It reads, quote, Dear President Kaufman, I beg leave to to suggest for your consideration the establishment of the university archives, end quote. The letter then goes on to suggest the libraries as an appropriate place to ho house these collections. Though is this really where the University of Minnesota archival collective memory begins? In order to create an archive at all, there has to be an existing memory or community to document. So does that collective memory begin at the university or at the archive? Additionally, who is being recorded in the dominant memory of this institution? Would then the institutional collective memory begin at the 1805 and 1851 unupheld and unethical treaties that impacted the land that this archive is currently occupying? From this point, the University of Minnesota archive collective memory gets a bit more nuanced. It has been shaped by what archivists worked here, what they collected, and what collections they chose to highlight. So the collective memory we are looking at today is not just that of the university, but that of the university archivists as a community unto themselves. 
Additionally, each archivist may have a different image of the university archives in this collective memory. For instance, as a white woman working in central processing, my collective memory may look different than that of other archivists or community members. Archivists working in units that focus on the experiences of marginalized groups will have a collective memory that differs. While we may be re referring to and remembering the same event, the impact and ramifications of that event will differ and thus result in two independent collective memories. One example of a specific community's collective memory differing from the quote unquote mainstream narrative is the local indigenous community's interactions with the university itself. We want to highlight here the Truth Report, a compiled set of reports built off of archival material hosted here at the university and featuring quite a bit of correspondence that focuses on the historical, systemic, and ongoing mistreatment of indigenous rights and sovereignty by the University of Minnesota. This report is both an excellent example of how the collective memories of communities differs in regards to the same history, and one of how one of these histories has historically been prioritized over any others due to structures of power. Furthermore, it demonstrates the role of archives and correspondence as a method to validate those collective memories. We highly recommend looking into the Truth Report for further information on Indigenous relations with the University of Minnesota. If we had time in this presentation, we could get into more questions like, who were the first archivists here? What were they collecting? How was the archive viewed then and how is it viewed today? What community was it made for and by who was it made? What are the demographics of that community and how do these archives serve them? However, we only have 20 minutes, but we want to acknowledge the importance of those questions as archivists and pitch them to you for further consideration. So let's discuss marking personal time in our collective history through correspondence. I personally believe that working in archives is working in people. We talked to Lisa Jeanette, head of the U, um, UMN Central Processing, about providing an example of the complexities that come with discussing correspondence and how it has impacted us as archivists. They noted that as a very broad category, some really personal materials end up in the correspondence folders, including things that the donor might not be aware we have or letters that were not intended to be kept, but were. And these can include some very intimate and traumatic details about a person's life, like children they did not know that they had. <laughs> As archivists, we don't always know what will be in correspondence, and it can be intensely personal. Lisa shared that from an ar archivist's perspective, it can really humanize the collection that you're working with and give you a way to empathize with someone you have no other connection to. So for me, most of the correspondence that has impacted me personally, I'm a bit reluctant to talk about because it feels so personal that it feels exploitative to discuss, which is an impulse that merits investigation. In one case, the letters in question were actually removed from the collection because of legal concerns regarding correspondence between lawyers and doctors. So the correspondence I do want to highlight today is a series of letters uh, that I worked with during my time at the Treader Collection. For those of you who may not be aware, the Jean Niklaus uh, Treader in GLBT Studies is an archive here at the university founded by activist Jean Treader and is one of the premier GLBT archives in the Midwest. These letters in particular were part of Jean's extensive personal collection and had been sent to him when he was working as a linguist in the US Navy in Vietnam during the late 50s, early 60s. Notably, these letters predate 1969 and the Stonewall Riots. At a glance, these are just letters from a friend back home, but with the added context that Jean was a gay man who was in the closet at the time, though not for much longer, it becomes very obvious that these are letters between a couple, and it's heartbreaking to see them talk around their feelings in order to stay safe, and it's incredibly heartening to see LGBT lives before 1969 when most narratives of our history begin. <laughs> Another example comes from Rebecca Tu, right over there, Collections Archivist at University Archives, which harkens back to our earlier, thank you, our earlier COVID correspondence examples. Rebecca was the project archivist for a legacy grant project in 2016 that processed the University of Minnesota radio station KUOM records and also digitized several thousand KUOM radio broadcasts. 
She worked to help create an online exhibit titled, quote, in the public interest, end quote, about how KUOM staff shifted their broadcast to an almost exclusive programming for children during the summer of the 1946 polio epidemic. At the end of July, there was a quarantine issued by then Mayor Hubert Humphrey to keep children at home. The radio station created special programs with music, rhymes, games, health education, and other entertainment. In a section of the exhibit titled, quote, The Response, end quote, Rebecca included letters that were received by the radio station from listeners, parents, University President James Lewis Morrell, and children, thanking them for the radio programs. One in particular is her favorite. A child wrote a poem thanking each of the radio station staff members. Let's look at one of the later letters dated September 20th, 1946. It reads, and it was kind of hard to read, so <laughs> let's hope I'm getting this right. Quote, dear KUOM, I want to thank you for the programs you put out during the polio epidemic. Here's the way I want to thank you. Alice Rice is so very nice, and so is Betty Gerling. Betty Mustard's program is full of twirling and whirling. Ray Christensen and Ruth Swanson are so good in every play. Ken Berry is such an actor and I hear him almost every day. Bob Boyle reads the newscast the best you've ever heard. Paul Matthews is such a good reader, he never stumbles on a word. Bob Runyon is an announcer and I think he's very good. And so is the engineer who's not on the air, but I think he should. <laughs> there are others on and off the air that I have forgotten or do not know, like Dr. Luke O'Brien and the one who's on Homemaker's Quarter, whose first name starts with Joe. <laughs> I want to thank KUOM for making the polio epidemic more pleasant. And everyone else, it was the best of any present. Sincerely yours, Ariane Coleman. This is an excellent example of how correspondence and the collective memory it, it helps create can place us into history as well as correlate to what's happening in our present. As archivists, we can almost live vicariously through others' memories in correspondence, as well as attach meaning that could be different and often it's profound to ourselves than what was originally intended. With correspondence, we often don't get to see the whole picture. And most of the time we only get half of what's going on as we have the letter, but almost never the reply. Check out this letter to a sense to science fiction author, author Clifford C. Mack by none other than George R. R. Martin in the 1980s, where an apparent feud is alluded to with the letter reading, quote, thanks for your letter of June 17th. I am sorry you won't be writing the introduction for New Voices 5 but I certainly understand your reasons. I must plead guilty to being one of those people who thought of you as Campbell, Campbell's writers. Although I was aware that your first sales preceded his editorial reign at Astounding. Given the relatively infrequent contact you did have with Campbell, you are of course correct. It would be more appropriate me, for me to get another introducer and will do so. And the letter goes on, end quote. As someone who processed this collection, I don't have any more information about what these letters mean. I cannot speak exactly to why Clifford Simek did not write that introduction to New Voice 5, nor do I know anything about Campbell, about what he thinks or even who he is. When looking at correspondence that includes famous individuals, it brings into question that idea, the idea of whether or not to uplift this correspondence or how much, how much research value it has. Does this letter become more important just because George R.R. R. Martin wrote it? Does it gain research value because of his affiliation? Are there letters that put this feud into context that go unuplifted because they don't have the celebrity name attached and are thus less memorable? So, how, so much of what we process is not seen. And what is our duty to uplift information as archivists? And for that matter, what information? Another example comes from Kate Dietrich, who's back there, curator of the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, who shared a couple of examples with us. The first correspondence she shared was a letter sent to the principal developer of the Calhoun Beach Club, a Jewish man named Harry Goldie. This letter starts out by discussing a proposal for the construction of a club, though then moves on to read, quote, I hate to interject anything unpleasant in this proposition, but it was intimated to me that you were under considerable pressure for leases to Jewish people. 
while it may be no concern of mine, I do think that the leases to these people will certainly be detrimental to the operation of your property. The proposition must go one way or the other. And I think if you let one Jewish family in, you are going to create dissension among your other tenants, which will react very unfavorably to your rental situation." End quote. Yeah, in discussion with Kate, we talked about the importance of having quote unquote proof of anti-Semitism. Communities rely heavily on collective memories of racism, anti-Semitism, and prejudice. Though often these communities are asked to quote unquote, quote unquote prove these instances, but not all of this is concretely documented. And finding an example of this in the archives is really important. Minneapolis at this time was being referred to in the national press as the quote, capital of American anti-Semitism, end quote. The club was eventually built, allowed Jewish businesses, and was visited by men such as Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mendel. Mondale, excuse me. <laughs> Which leads us into our last talk how collective memory impacts education, and specifically how that education in turn affects the social transmission of memory through the University of Minnesota students. We talked to several archivists to see how what they have found in various collections impacted them to the point that they wanted or felt that they needed to share this information as educators. Again, it's important to note that what we feel is interesting, important, or relevant is impacted by our own experiences as archivists and the community we exist in, and thus the materials we choose to elevate are not neutral. One example of correspondence and collective memory amongst archivists specifically tied to education comes from our amazing archivist, Amanda Wick, who is at the back of the Charles Babbage Institute Archives, which focuses on the history of technology. Here we see a selection of letters from the Control Data Corporation that Amanda's predecessor showed to her on her first day of work. Uh, in the archives. So this is a letter written to William C. Norris, head of the CDC at the time, complaining that the CDC had been selling computers to Russia during the Cold War. Please note, there is strong language in this letter. I'm warning you, I have a trained American bald eagle named Ralph who will attack your big goddamn glass building up there in America's version of Siberia. And he's gonna shit all over your glass panels if you don't stop pushing this computer sale to the commies. I'll even feed him Carter's little liver pills to make him shit more than he does. <laughs> I'm serious. Stop this dealing with the Ruskies or Ralph will get you. We do not have a copy of Mr. Norris's reply to this letter. Uh, though according to our reference, he did send one. Nor do we know if Mr. Norris was got by Ralph. <laughs> this is a great example as correspondence as a way to humanize the past. We all know someone who would talk like this to a manager. Amanda uses these letters, not for researchers, but specifically for classroom education with students who don't usually work with historical materials, as a way to bridge that veneer of history and allow them to relate to the past. So here we see not just correspondence as a tool for education, but the collective memory of archivists. As seen by Amanda's predecessor highlighting these letters specifically, her using them for education, and me in turn bringing them to you. The collective memory of our institution elevates these particular records, perhaps at the cost of others. What other correspondence is there in the CBI archives or in the CDC collection that could make great educational or research tools and what other perspectives might they highlight? We wanna end this presentation by first thanking our colleagues for participating in this discussion with us. We cannot possibly cover the immense topic of collective memory and archives through correspondence in such a short time, though we are honored to have been able to facilitate these conversations, highlight interesting correspondence, and overall ask questions. The University of Minnesota archives are available to the public as well as the content that is digitized on the media. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>
Uh, he's asking the date of this last letter. I do not believe, Amanda, you don't have this though, do you? We don't have this on record. I could probably dig it up. And if you wanted to ask to see these letters, we can definitely produce them for you. <laughs> Thanks so much for the question. I appreciate it. So, I, don't know who I want to invite all of you to see some of the exhibits that we have up in the building right now. There are three, so you can spend the afternoon here, wait for it to stop raining. Um, so symbolic significance, which is about the Jewish community groups working with school districts on respecting Jewish holidays. And that is by the Berman uh, Upper Midwest Jewish Archives. And that is on the third floor gallery. And you can take the elevator at the back of the building. Dance Roots, Minnesota's Movers and Shakers, Deborah mentioned this to us earlier, which is on the rich history of dance, education, and performance in the Twin Cities. That's located in the gallery right across the hall. And Eyes on the World, Cartography in the Age of Sail, with maps and atlases produced from the 15th through the 18th centuries. And that is on the ground floor right below us in the Wallen Center. Um, if you are interested in a tour, please meet Chris at the back. And thank you so much for attending. Please join us again on November 3rd for presentations from the Upper Midwest Literary Archives and the University Archives.